welcome to Pierce Podcast. I'm Mike. And this is Rolando, and we're in episode 425. And this is a different episode. We're finally doing yeah. an interview again. Yeah, we got another interview. And uh, for all the people who've been watching and listening and have heard all of the Tim the Slim shout outs, especially on our lives, we've got our, our almost mandatory Tim the Slim shout out on our lives. Uh, we've got in the flesh, well, in the studio, well, his own studio. I don't know. He's here with us, Tim the Slim. How are you doing, man? Doing great. Hey, Mike. Hey, Orlando. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and I appreciate you finally being here. We finally got you here. Now we now we won't shout you out anymore. We're doing the interview just so I'm just joking, but no, there's uh, there's tons of other people in the Discord that need to shout out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. I always appreciate Tim, and I appreciate the fact that he's a, he's been a teacher, and now he sells full time. Even though I remember selling him, I don't know, man. I don't know if you should jump ship yet. Like, you know, make sure you have your ducks in a row. And Tim's like, nope. I'm doing it. And he did it. And he did it well. So, hey, Tim, tell us a little bit about you. Um, where, do, where can people find you? And uh, just a little bit of your story. I know that's not the first question we gave you in the questions, but just oh, no, I thought no, sure. we'd start off with that. Sure, sure. Uh, so so first I wanted to say this is like a dream come true, being on with you guys on the I'm longest so reselling podcast out there, right? Um, you guys literally changed my life. And I know that you're changing lives of, of people out there uh, that you probably don't even know. Uh, but yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a full-time reseller. I'm up in Northwest Montana. Uh, I was a teacher for about 10 years and I was a music teacher. Uh, K-12 music ed was my degree. Um, loved what I did. It was, it was a great job and everything, but you know, other opportunities presented themselves in reselling. And so I, I made the switch uh, about 18 months back now to be a full-time reseller, uh, just as a solo adventure doing mostly garage sales, estate sales, all that kind of thing. And so now here I am. All right, and so where are you on Instagram? Do you have a YouTube? All that, all that stuff. So, so for real, like I don't have that kind of presence. I'm, I'm not out there. But okay, right. you can look me up. I am, I am on Instagram at Educated Flips, okay. at Educated Flips. Um, but I haven't posted in like a year. I gave it a trial run like a year ago, and I'm like, probably not for me. I might, I might fire it up. You know, you can, you can hit me up there, um, and we'll see if YouTube, you know, ever gets rolling. All right, let me just plug the Discord. You can always find Tim at our Discord. So if you ever want to join the Discord, go to patreon.com slash peers of podcast for five fifty five a month. You can join us there. All right. So let me let me ask you right off the bat here. So you um we, we connected on the Discord. Uh we hit it off pretty quick on there because we've got so many similarities. I mean, even with Orlando, uh we're all educators. We've we've been in the education field. Um, and a lot of people who are listening to the podcast are part-time resellers, right? They've got a nine to five uh, and it can range from, you know, any, any field that they're in. Uh, but you left a, a career, right? Like you didn't just leave a, 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 you know, working at a fast food restaurant or something like you left a career where you went to school to do uh, what, what was it about reselling that made you feel you could make that jump? And how has your life kind of changed and shifted as you've done that? Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I will tell you that as a, I, I will probably have some friends and family watching this, but, but I, and I just want to make it clear to everybody out there, teaching is a noble profession. It's wonderful. I, I was working with the best staff one could ask for, the best administration. I was working with the best families, best kids. We were growing a great program. You know, I was a music teacher for, for a number of years, um, great relationships with the students and, and things were great. But, but in the end, you know, if, it comes down to family. It comes down to free time. It comes down to flexibility. And it comes down to, you know, I didn't want to sit 30 years from now looking back and say, like, what if we did try this thing out? What if we did create this adventure? Um, it got to this point where, like, I was I was doing reselling on the side, you know, like a lot of teachers do this side gig. Um, and I, I got to the point where I, I looked at my finances and I'm like, shoot, like I, I could do this full time. I could free up so much time to be at field trips with my kids or to have that that energy after school because, you know, teaching just drains. Um, and, and in the end, I just, I, I made that leap, you know, so it was, it was really more a gradual process. Um, I would say like, it, it was probably over the course of five years of, uh, you know, from really taking it seriously to the point where I said, okay, you know, this, this needs to happen. Um, and, and I'll tell you, it was, it's not an easy decision, obviously, like, like the year before I was looking at master's programs, doctor doctoral routes like what could I do to really throw myself into teaching or should I really throw myself into reselling and and like I said family is is really what 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 won out I get that I get that now 
what initially got you like selling on eBay that, you know, that's because there's always that one thing like where you go to, oh, I'm going to do this for a little bit. And then you're like, wait, I'm actually making money. So then you start making more money. And I, I feel like it's snowball. At least that was my experience. That was kind of Mike's experience. What was your experience? Like take us to like that first eBay sale that hooked you and you started moving forward. Oh, okay. If you can remember. So, no, well, well I, I opened my eBay account when I was 18. I'm 33 now. And okay. so uh, when, when you open that, it, it was, it was uh, initially in the Craigslist days where you could still find stuff on Craigslist and you could find mm-hmm. those video game lots and you could break them up and you, you know, you could, you realize like, holy buckets, this is like a real thing. Like, like I can, I can make this, I can make money just appear. Like I could just create, you know, I can create value out of thin air. And so that was great. Um, I'm also a pretty, pretty avid Magic the Gathering player. And so you know, you'd go to tournaments and things, you'd have those extra cards and you could, you could just offload them, um, on, on eBay. I think the, the, yeah, the, the, the one where it hit the, the, the most was I was at a tournament and I pulled this card and it, it's a card called Elspeth. It's like, it was a really cool card back then. And, you know, it's like, Oh, that, that guy got Elspeth. And, and so, um, on my, uh, my first sale was like this you know, 30, $40 card at the time. And I just thought that was so cool. Cause it's like that paid for my tournament that, you know, and then, then it went from there, you know, video game lots, um, just selling things around the house. And then you, you, um, the, the first, the first big hit that like, I realized this is like a real thing was when there was some, uh, some RA uh, retail arbitrage through Hobby Lobby. Actually, I bought, a, yeah. I had a, I had boxes of the old, like uh, the Hot Wheels tracks delivered to my house. They had them on sale where if you like bought $300, $300 worth, it was like some kind of a discount and then free shipping. And anyway, long story short, I ended up buying, you know, boxes upon boxes and, and made like a thousand bucks just selling them in, nice. in packs. And then I'm, I was hooked. I'm like, okay, let's try this. Yeah. That is oh, that's awesome. So, and I, I, I love that. I love that you mentioned the, the magic, the gathering cards and, uh, and pulling something and selling that back before I really got going on reselling. Uh, I was just starting like trying and I was selling stuff that I already had. Like I sold an old Kindle, sold some magic the gathering cards and same thing. It was, I was going to some like Friday night magic draft games yeah. and I was just playing like draft magic and I, I wasn't even that great, but occasionally, you know, you pull some cards and uh, you'd win and you pull a couple cards and I can almost guarantee that I could get my, my tournament paid for just by selling a handful of the, the rares that I pulled. And that was, that was one of the things that before I really got moving was just, yeah, selling things that kind of paying for your own hobby or the things you already had uh, in front of you. Um, did, is that, you mentioned like video games and stuff like what, what is, what was the categories you started in and, and what kind of categories are you selling in now? Um, you know, it's, it's, I'm, I'm the stereotypical everything seller, honestly. Uh, so I, with, with garage sales, estate sales, just anything of value. Um, I actually project myself when I'm at sales. Now I project myself as a bookseller. Uh, I find that if you give someone a card that says, Hey, I just sell everything. Like that doesn't really get you where anywhere a lot of the time. But if you can say like, no, I, I sell this. Um, and so, so I, I am the everything seller. Uh, so are you saying that you tell people you're a bookseller and that gets people to more consistently get back to you? Or are you saying, yeah. like, but they'll give you other categories too. They're like, Hey, by the way, I also sell in this. Yeah. And, I, and there's, so, so this in, in my plan for next year, next summer yeah. when it's sourcing season around here, cause we don't have sourcing in the winter. Um, I, I'm actually working on a, a new strategy. I'm going to be making up a different business card for every niche, honestly, because I really? think that that okay. when you, when you're able to present yourself as I am the expert, I'm the person, you know, who you need to go to for whatever, then people are more prone to reach out for you. So, um, you know, right now it, it's, it's books, uh, but I'm hoping to, to be able to present myself that way for, for a lot of different categories. And, and I, with, so, I, I do sell on FBA too. Okay, okay. <laughs> but you don't source books exclusively, right? You source oh, whatever. So. <laughs> so, okay. So you get calls about books, but do you sometimes get calls that are non-books? Very rarely right now. Okay, okay, okay. Like, yeah, very rarely. But it's very, but you get, you would say you get more callbacks because you are seen as like an authority in that field. Absolutely. Like, like okay. since I, That's since I started presenting myself that way, I've got estate clean out companies that are calling me and saying, Hey, we got all the books. Like if you just want to have them, you can, you can come take them. I have storage locker guys that are like, Hey, he's the book guy. Like come take a look at our books. So I I feel like if you could do that in whatever niche you're in, 
You can get, I you really get appreciate that. I that goes contrary to everything I do. So that's good. Yeah. It's good for me that to ca- hear. That kind of reminds me of um I don't know if you remember the old, you know, show with Johnny Knoxville back on MTV, that whole group of guys. One of the guys on there, I watched a documentary of that group of guys. One of the guys on there, um, I think it was the guy that passed away, I don't remember his name, but uh on his documentary, he um he had kind of a similar thing. He would have business cards for all kinds of stuff, but a lot of them were like fake things that he had to like, he'd be talking to somebody and they'd mention something about airplanes or NASA and be like, Oh look. And he pulled out his business card. I'm actually the director of blah, blah, blah. But, but yeah, I mean, you could have like a, almost a portfolio of business cards, depending on what type of estate sale or garage sale you're at. And if it, if you see the type of thing that they're selling um, and, and yeah, you could start with maybe a handful, right? Like three or four niches, Here's my video game one. Here's my book one. Here's my vintage electronics. And depending on the the stuff that they have there, like you said, presenting yourself that way, I think that's that's a brilliant idea. I like that. I'm just fascinated because I never do that because I always don't want to miss out, right? Because people always ask me, what do you sell? I'm like, oh, I sell anything. Here's my card. But now I'm thinking about what you said and I go, <laughs> maybe, maybe I need to do it the other way, right? Because I, I always tell people and the advice I've given for years on the podcast has been, you know, don't don't list out what you're looking for because it ends up getting people not to call you back if they have something that's worth of value, right? So if you just have video yeah. games, books, and then let's say they have a vintage train collection, they're not going to call you because you just have books and video games. But you know what? If if it works and it allows you to get better calls on that in that one niche, it may be worth it because I see it on Craigslist all the time. People are like. I only do video games and I'm pretty sure those people get called all the time because people feel like they are the authority. So what you're saying completely makes sense. And uh, I always love hearing a different perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Think about it like a, like a plumber or electrician or anything. You're not, you, you, when you're looking for a specific job, you're going to Google mm. and find that person, the That's expert, good. the pro. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. We'll see if it works. Try it the next year. Right. And, and we'll end the episode on that and that skill right there. Like <laughs> that was so good. That was good. Yeah, in good. Itself. All right, so talk to me about, okay, you're part-time, right? You're teaching. And I I remember there was a time before I jumped full-time that my part-time reselling was actually full-time, right? Mm-hmm. It, it's, all I, it's all I thought about. Like, I remember in the beginning, I would teach. I'd go home, maybe work on lesson plans, shoot some emails off, you know, spend time with the family. And then once everybody was asleep, I spent like three hours, like, listing stuff. Like, that's all I did for, like, a long time. Mm-hmm. But then... I remember going, you know what? And then I remember, especially when I became an administrator and had a little bit more freedom in my time, I'm like, I'm going to go to lunch. But instead, I'm just going to go to the thrift store, right? And then I remember in the mornings, I'm like, all right, now I'm going to I'm gonna ship stuff off early in the morning. And it just began to consume more and more of what I did. I still mm-hmm. did all my job duties well and everything functioned as it should have. But I found that it just it got to a place where I did have to make that decision. Do you kind of see that route with you? Yeah. Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, that route where as far as like went back when I was part time of. It kept gradually growing and growing and consuming what you did. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You, you get to that point where so like I'm an all or nothing kind of guy. When, when I go into something, I'm going to commit. I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And I found I could not do this to the best of my ability. I could not do behind. I could not do the reselling to the best of my ability, nor could I do teaching to the best of my ability. You feel like a like your, your piece of toast getting the, the butter spread too thin. It's everywhere. You, you're not, no one's enjoying anything. And so like it got to that point where like, like I, I don't know if I told you already, but uh, I was looking at master's and doctoral programs yeah, yeah. the year before. And so it was like, we got two routes. Like I'm either going to make reselling very part-time and I'm going to jump full head on into, um, you know, teaching and really get good at that, you know, work, work myself up into maybe, maybe teaching collegiately, maybe, um, doing that kind of thing, or we're going to, you know, put the teaching on the back burner and reselling, we're just going to jump full on into. And so it got, got to the point where, um, so I'm, I'm a big, I'm a big believer that what gets recorded gets improved. Right. And so I would actually, um, I have a spreadsheet every single day. I record how many hours I worked on the business. And during the, um, the teaching time, I would say, uh, towards the end, it was 20 hours a week. I was trying to put 20 hours a week on top of teaching into this. Um, and you know, you, you log that each and every day. And then if you're working more than that, that kind of gives you the guide of like talking with my wife, like, Hey, I know I've been working too, too much on this. Cause I've, I've recorded that. I'm going to pull back a little bit and the vice versa, you know, like if you're not getting to that mark, you want to be, you have that, that set goal, um, you know, with, with 
uh, I'd have that set goal with my spouse so that she would be like, okay, yeah, you know, um, this is important. We need to, to bump that up. But, you know, 20 hours was about all I could really handle. And I'm like, if we, if we can jump into T, uh, jump into full time, then let's do it. How many, how many hours uh, a week would you say you're putting in now that you're full time? Is it a full 40 or are you working so, more or less? It, it, it's so seasonal. Uh, like, cause here we, I would say the summer I'm working more. Um, I think last year I want to say I averaged 35 hours a week the whole year. Hmm. And that was with, um, or not last year, excuse me, the year, yeah, the year when I left teaching, it was 35 hours a week average. Um, this year I've not done the numbers all the way, but I would say, I would say we're at about 45 to 55 hours a week, depending um, right. it's, it's a little bit less in the winter cause I, there's really no sourcing opportunities. I'm just kind of doing a lot of listing here. Uh, but then in the summer it really ramps up. Which is pretty crazy because you, you figure when you were teaching full time, you know, you're putting in more than 40 hours a week teaching plus another 20 hours. So you're doing 60 <laughs> hours a week. So you call it part-time resell. And that's what everybody says. Oh, you're a part-time reseller, but you're, you're working 60 hours a week, 20 hours. You're actually, when you were working, averaging 35 hours a week, you're only working 15 more hours on reselling per week than you were before. Yeah. And yet you're making it, you know, like that's pretty yeah. incredible. Yeah. You know, when it, what it came down to was, uh, in that 20 hours a week, we figured I was doing about, or excuse me, we, we, we did the math and it was about, um, one third. So I, I'd have to put in one third of the effort to make about half my teacher salary. And so we figured that huh. if we could increase the effort by three times, it'd be about one and a half times the, the salary. And that has rung out to be about true. Nice. Nice. I do. And that kind of leads. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say that kind of leads to like the, what I was going to ask next with, I, I, I picture you as kind of like a numbers person. Like you, you said it took five years to move from to move from kind of part-time reselling, kind of getting into it before you made that leap to say, okay, now I'm going to be a full-time reseller. Um, did you have like specific numbers in mind, like a goal, like I need to have X amount of inventory, I need to be clearing X amount, or was it kind of just a gut feeling of, I feel like things are moving in a good direction, I could probably make this jump? Because you rev- there, there's never like a perfect linear you know, you're kind of, there's always a little bit of a gamble there, but, but were you basing that off of numbers or were you kind of just like, I think, I think I could do this. Yeah. Oh no. And, and you hear, you see that question all the time, right? And like if you're in Facebook groups or on, on Reddit or whatever, people who are looking at full time, like what's, what's the signal um, for me and it's different for everybody, but for me, I'm blessed to have a, a spouse who she still is a teacher um, at, at the school that I was at. Um, and so she, has the benefits that goes along with that, which that is usually the huge, you know, hiccup for most people. And we're able to get that through, through them and they pay a portion of the family too. So it's wonderful. Um, but we, we ran the numbers and basically found out that like in order for us to just pay the bills and kind of be net zero, like I would just have to make about $1,000 a month doing this. And that would be net zero, like no savings, no retirement, no anything. And, and, you know, we were already doing that with the part-time. And so we figured like, worst comes to worst, I, I make the jump, doesn't go well, we're still paying the bills, you know, teaching is not going anywhere. There's a teacher shortage, like that, that job is going to be there. Maybe not the same job, but but teaching in general is never going away. <laughs> no, that's good. So what, what did you, so you're saying monetarily you're at that level. Now your inventory, you know, things have changed over time or it used to be listen and forget it that I'm old school and I'm still suffering through that. And then uh, there's the, you know, you got to move things quickly. Now, did you always find yourself like when you were sourcing, you were trying to move things quick and that helped you out? Is that how you started? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm big on sell through. I'm big on okay. you. You look at the what's what's sold, and if you got like the same amount sold as uh, listed right now, then 100 percent sell through, you're good to go. So yeah, I've always, if you're talking fast, you know, fast nickel, slow dime, I'm probably more on the fast nickel. Uh, but honestly, I'm I'm more of just what's going to sell, sell, sell what people like. <laughs> no, I get it. Now, now talk to me a little bit. Okay. So you're married, right? And I always say it's easier when you're married to resell, right? Cause let's say you get sick and, and you can't ship out your packages. Is your wife able to ship out packages? Does she know, like, do you have everything perfectly labeled in your custom SKU and things go south? Nope. It's me. If, if, okay. if I'm waking up sick one morning, like this, this has got to happen. Right. Uh, she, she is, <coughs> She supports me. She loves me. She she stays by me for all of this. 
but she does not want to touch reselling in the slightest. Okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> so you don't you don't talk reselling. It's not like you, you know. You, okay, all right, no, because everybody's no, different, we, right? No, no, some... and that's I I can I can really respect those husband wife teams. Like that's that's great. I know Mike, you got that. You know, you guys do posh and things together too. That's that's really cool when you can have that bond. Um, but I, I'll I'll take the support right now. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. Well, I, I encourage you to get everything set up because you never know. Like I remember back in the day when I was married, I remember leaving for a DC trip with eighth graders and we were gone for two weeks and I sold like 50 items, but I didn't have them organized. And I remember mm. at that time going, I'm sure it's in the third toe in this closet. And I remember it became like a five hour fiasco, like trying to find stuff. And, and uh, I always tell people like have a backup plan if things worse are coming worse. You, I mean, you still have it good, right? Because if things actually do go, you can always tell her, hey, I think it's in you know the third shelf, book number five or whatever. Like you know where things are at. But I always encourage people be organized because what if you have to have a complete stranger show up and like you got to call your friend who has knows nothing about recently. Like, can you make it still happen? But um, it's great. It's great that, you know, now I'm pretty sure that the income does help. Right. That's that's what everybody tells me. Like when one one person in the relationship doesn't care about reselling, as long as you're reaching goals, like everything's all good. Right. And and so did, did you have to get buy in from your wife eventually to agree with you to go full time or is she fully on board from the beginning? And I'm not trying to stir up trouble. I'm just asking the question. <laughs> oh, no, no. Fair enough. We you know, we have such a loving relationship a great partnership where it's like it she she trusts me completely i trust her completely and it's one of those things that we got to that point where you know i was able we were able to sit down and just look at the finances she doesn't like looking at finances but i was able to show her the numbers and and say hey here's here's what we can do um here's what i think it'll take and uh you know she trusts me with it and so i'm blessed to have that and you fulfilled right you you got it done like right off the bat well, and, that, and that's a motivator, right? Like, if you don't make this happen, like that, you, you, if you can do it, you owe it to your family, right? Like, you, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. Now, I, I was thinking back to the beginning of this podcast here. Orlando had kind of mentioned that uh, he was not trying to to completely persuade you away from reselling full time, but he was he was you know being that angel on the side or maybe the devil on the side, going, "Are you sure Easy you now. want to do Easy. this?" You know, uh, so. You know, you, you've got that aspect of it, but then I, I've been watching you in the Discord. I've been seeing the stuff you've been doing. You, you've actually had a lot of success, even when you know I've had you know some dry spells here recently. Orlando's been talking a lot on the podcast about you know things have been down for a while. It seems like things are ticking back up. Uh, but but from watching your growth, like to see you going from part time reseller to where you are now, like it seems like you've had a, a pretty steady, consistent growth. Your store is doing really well. What are some of the strategies you've used now that you've moved to full time to uh, really be a successful reseller? Like what, what are some of the things you've implemented or, or strategies or tactics that you've, you've done? So some strategies, some tactics to be successful. Um, <laughs> Orlando's not going to like this word. Discipline. Yes. There you go. Discipline. Yes. Rub it in. <laughs> no, no. It's like, it's like salt, salt in his because wound. It's great. I know. As a former administrator and a part-time one now, like I, I need to just embrace that word. Right. And I, I, I joke, I physically say that, yeah. but yes, go ahead. No, go ahead. I, Drop the so, discipline, Tim. <laughs> so, so <clears throat> coming, coming from a teaching profession, right? Like teachers are freaking unicorns. Like these people that, that teach, they, p- people with real jobs. And I say real jobs, not outside of reselling. I'm saying real jobs, like outside of the classroom who, you know, get normal lunch breaks or can be like a couple minutes late to work and nothing, there's nothing explodes, right? Nothing's crazy. Or they can, you know, to actually take a day off work and they don't have to come up with lesson plans or like, like punt and say, you know, things fall apart. Like if you're not there as a teacher, um, it is a hard profession profession. It is an honorable profession. It's a, it, there, there's so many great talented people teaching. And I, I say it all the time that if, if someone can make an, an a okay living teaching, they can make a fantastic living doing just about anything else because they are, mm-hmm. you know, the skills you have as a teacher are just phenomenal. And I will say that that being a teacher and having that discipline to, to show up every day and to be able to, to have your ducks in a row and, you know, measuring and measuring, we, we measure all the time in education, like what gets measured gets improved. And I'm, I'm doing that each and every day. Um, like that, that's all there is to it. 
is it's, it's discipline, it's showing up and it's, it's getting out there each and every day. Um, you know, as far as strategies where I'm at, you know, I'm in Northwest Montana. There's, um, you know, like a million people in the whole state, right. We don't got a lot of, of people here. It's a tourist, tourist, uh, town kind of a thing. Um, we, I live in one of the bigger areas. We're just like a, a little bit South of Glacier National Park, but, um, I, I am, I, I am so disciplined to get out there in on the Thursday, Friday, Saturday garage sale routes. Like if there's a garage sale within 50 miles, like I'm there, it's not a matter of like picking and choosing, right? Like California there where you, you got hundreds, like yep. literally if there's a garage sale sale, I will be there. <laughs> and so, you know, it's that consistency, that discipline. So how's the competition out there? Cause you know, here it's insanity, mm. but in Montana, is there, is there a lot of competition? Do you find, or do you, you know, run across the same amount of people every time you go somewhere? You do. You do. You actually, it's like the same okay. group at every single sale. And you almost like, you're like, all right, see you at the next one. Cause you know, we're all kind of on the same route. Uh, competitions, I would say it scales appropriately with the population from what I can see. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's kind of cool to be a, a, a bigger fish in a, a small pond. Um, but I, I do think that, I don't know. We're going to see where this thing lands. I know that I can make a decent full-time living as far as the scalability, you know, you might need to be in a bigger city to, to really get those opportunities unless you're going to move to the retail arbitrage world and that kind of thing. Um, but no, there's, it's, it's fun with the competition. It's fun to like see the same guys and kind of rib them. And, you know, you, you, I know that this guy goes after this and I go after this They're like, Hey Tim, there's books in the corner. I'm like, Oh yeah. Yeah. Joe, there's some tools over there in the corner. And um, you know, it's, it's a, it's fun. All right. So I can, I can tell you're a teacher. You're just a natural on the podcast. Like, I feel like you could, you could run your own podcast. You could be our, our third, like, yeah, you know, just keep me on. on the yeah, we just, I mean, you do such a fantastic job. Now, do you find that some of your people skills, I mean, I don't know how much you negotiate, but do you feel like that's kind of lent to you being able to find these scores, being able to negotiate good deals, or are you just, you just pay up front? What, what, how's it look like? Oh, for dude, you? Uh, did the, every, anybody listening to this now in 2024 needs to back up and find your guys's book study on never split the difference. Oh, Chris Voss. Yeah, it's right there, right there. That book changes phenomenal. everything. Oh my gosh. Um, I will, I will say that as a teacher, you guys are probably familiar with love and logic. Uh, love, love and logic is, is a classroom management strategy. Maybe you could even call it a discipline strategy, but it has everything to do with, with empathy. Right. Hmm. And that that book never split the difference effectively is empathy. It's like love and logic, except in the business world. Like that's all that book is. Huh. It's it's stepping into somebody else's shoes and, and being able to get on their level and be real with them and be authentic with them, fill their need, you know, figure out what they need, figure out how you guys can can work together to, to come to a solution. Uh, and so I'll, I'll say that that that's everything. You know, empathy is really everything. And, and it's literally it's literally every business. It's literally every job, right? Like that's, that's once you can understand that, like the doors are open for, for just about anything. It's, it's funny you say that because reselling has actually made me a better teacher and a better administrator, right? So like the skills we picked up from here at first, it was only for reselling, mm -hmm. right? It's like, how do I get that better deal? But now it's actually helped me in my relationship with people when I talk to people, like, it's just, it's very fascinating. Even to this day, whenever Chris Voss is on TikTok or he's on some real, like I listen to what he says. And like this last weekend, I remember I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to try this. Like everywhere I go, I'm going to ask for a little bit more. Right. So I went to the drive through with, with my son at Dunkin' Donuts and I was like, Hey, it's kind of the end of the night. Do you have any uh, extra donuts? You know, you, you kind of are going to do away with. And she looked at me and she's like, yeah. And I said, well, would you be willing to share with some of those? And she's like, well, what do you want? And I just gave her some and she just gave it to me. Right. Like and then um, and then the other day, like I, I really I have I have a huge backyard and I didn't want to use my old mower. And so I went to the neighbor and I'm like, hey, man, I see you have to sit down mower." And he's like, why are you here? I'm like, he's like, he's like, usually people are here to beg, borrow and steal. Well, I'm kind of here to beg and borrow. But, you know, it'd be great if you could you know, help me out with my backyard. And he's like, sure, come borrow it. And I just saved myself 20 hours, right? And this is like wow. stuff that I would never have learned until like Chris Voss's book, reselling, having to be, you know, 
in these situations where you you want empathy, right? And you also want to be able to be able to negotiate your way, and, and so you're not splitting the difference. And uh, I'm trying to think another. I had another place that I tried yeah. it out too, where I asked for something extra, and they're like, "Sure." So I find that reselling change. Not only you're talking about teaching change your reselling. I would say reselling just changes how you do a lot of things. Oh, 100 percent. There's there's so much opportunity out there, like people like asking you will receive right um yeah, and yeah. there's you don't realize you don't know until you ask you don't yeah. and, and getting the no like getting the no is so big in life once you once you're comfortable getting that no oh my gosh it it opens so many doors um but but to, to talk about sorry go ahead mike no continue oh sorry yeah. no uh, so to, to talk about people like the a phrase that's been that i got from another group that um i've been just putting at the forefront of my business is people, not products. Like we should be chasing people, not the products, because you, that that's where everything starts. Um, mm-hmm. Like talking about the, the the giving out card out, you know, saying, "Hey, I'm a bookseller," and all of a sudden, like I found the people with the product. They're they're coming to me with with uh, houses full of books, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, people, not products. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, it's, that's it's so true. That, that's awesome, and I, I like I like that you you kind of mentioned because I've I've said the same thing about teaching as far as there's so many skills that you have. In fact, I, I recently heard a study that said of all the professions of people who are most likely to become a millionaire, teachers is uh, is up there, right? Not in the yeah. teaching field, but but teachers are one of the the most likely to become millionaires because so many of the skills that they have and they've learned from teaching can transfer over to other things. And, and like Orlando was saying, and like you mentioned as well, the same thing could be true of, of reselling, right? We, we've had full podcasts about how the overlap of reselling in other business areas. So mm-hmm. when it comes to some of the things you've learned, I mean, obviously you took you know knowledge that you had before, brought that into reselling. Reselling is teaching you more knowledge. You were a, a money guy, a numbers guy before. You looked at budgets. Would you say that now the things you're learning reselling, taxes, really understanding how to operate a business, does that give you aspirations to use reselling as a launching pad into something else? Or are you really content right here in the reselling field? No, that's a, that's a, that's a really, question. that's an interesting question. Yeah. You will kind, kind of what, what you're alluding to too, it's a, is, you know, reselling is the building blocks. Reselling really is like the core of capitalism, right? Um, every single business out there, it's the same thing. It's you're buying something at a low price, you're doing a value add and then giving a good or service out to the community, you know, that at, at a higher price. As far as like for me personally, if, if uh, it's something I, I want to pursue, I, I don't think so. I don't think so at this time. Um, I do know that by doing it, it's given me the skills that in case I ever do need to get want to get to that point, like I feel like I could just like tomorrow, I could just like open a fast food truck. Like I could open a food truck and, and probably do pretty good with just some, some studying and figuring out the business. And that could be said about anything, you know, whether it's like becoming a builder or doing landscaping or whatever you want to do, like this gives you those building blocks. But as far as like, if that's something I'm going to pursue personally, uh, I don't think so. Okay. okay. No. And I, I very much, you know, I appreciate the fact that <laughs> you went on your own. Like I, 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 you know, I keep going back to that conversation you and I had, in the in the messaging and the discord where you're like well what do you think and i'm like you need this this and this i was trying to be like a dad or whatever right and i'm yeah. only 12 years older than you i'm not well that's still kind of older but generation but it was one of those things i wanted to look out for you and you just you made it happen right off the bat you know you took care of everything but i'm sure there are still things that you're like i wish i did things differently so what what are some things that you wish you had started off differently or maybe you're like i did everything fine Oh yeah, I'm perfect, Which is okay right? Too. <laughs> I'm perfect, and right now I'm perfect. It's just it, no. There's there's always improvement. There's always growth. Um, like as as far as it, there, there's so many things that you you can try to expedite to teach, but there's so much that you almost just need to experience. You need to get yeah. in there. Um, you know, probably the old me. Like I guess I'm thinking back to day one. Okay, here, here's some more silly ones for day one. So like day one, <laughs> like get a scale. I, these are the basic things, right? Because yeah, yeah. I remember literally one day, like I was I was shipping out some of my first orders and, and like, you know, if it's under a pound, it was first class at the time, right? You know, you could send it first class. And so I'm sitting there like, I don't even know how to weigh this thing. So I, I you go to the fridge and you get like a pound of meat and you're holding your item and you're like, is it, is it <laughs> under a pound? I'm not, I'm not really so sure. Oh my goodness. And, and then, so, so get yourself a scale um, and, and 
get yourself like a uh, as as close to a real photo setup as you can. Because uh, I think I think the problem too is like when people start, you know, you don't want to invest even twenty thirty dollars like into lights or something because you don't know how far it's going to go. But you know, I, I would probably get myself a little more established earlier on. Um, not not to spend an arm and a leg, but you know, even even a hundred dollars can go so far in just getting a couple lights, mm-hmm. um, getting a, a cheap Amazon scales. So you know what you're doing. Um, you know, maybe even getting a secondhand uh, thermal printer. Uh, so you're not lugging around a laser printer to like hotels and things like that. Um, <laughs> there's there's so much that you could do to really um, get it going right from the beginning. I think another thing that uh, I don't know that I never necessarily made a lot of bad buys um, early on. Like a lot of people say like, oh yeah, I bought a bunch of junk and then I figured out I can't really sell it. I, I was really good at the comping early on, um, but I, I would pay more attention to what other people were doing sooner. Uh, I, I don't think, you know, as, as teachers, right, you say you're always beg, borrowing and stealing from other people. Like you just, you always are taking what other people are doing. And, and in reselling, if, if, you're, if you're in this game early on and you're like, I'm really not sure what I'm doing, find the people who know what they're doing and just kind of ghost them. Don't be creepy about it, but like follow around at the, at the yard sales and see like, okay, what, what is that guy buying? Why is he buying? And then look those up and, and figure that out. Um, and then I guess the final thing is, is as you're, as you're sourcing, um, you're eventually, if you're like a garage sale estate, so guy, you're eventually going to see um, the same things everywhere. Right. And, and I always tell people, it's not really like, it's not that you can identify, Hey, I know that is valuable but you can identify all the stuff that's not valuable. And if you can get to that point and just see the patterns of what's not valuable, you'll be able to pick out the gems. Um, that, that's just time, right? Like time, the more time you're there, the more time you see the stuff, it just, it, it, that comes with time. You can't, you can't really teach that. That's just the experience. Like you said, that's good. Now you did mention, uh, you know, weighing, you know, try to weigh out some meat and then an item, uh, that, that's a good <laughs> lesson learned. But what about, uh, what about like your biggest mistake? Like what was what was the thing that like starting out like when when you're telling the stories the war stories about reselling what was your big mistake? <clears throat> so I have like a specific one that comes to mind that that's was a bad one, but it, it's not. It, this this could be summed up as stay in your lane, right? Because because mm-hmm. you know you do need to experiment, you do need to try things. But I, I'll specifically remember there was one time. I saw a pressure fryer that was an hour and a half away and I started looking up the comps for it. I'm like, shoot, this thing can sell for like 800 to $1,500. Like it, it could be like a real thing. And so I didn't have a truck at the time, but I borrowed my father-in-law's truck. I drove an hour and a half there. It was middle of the night. You can't really see much. Paid the guy a hundred bucks for it, hoisted it into the truck, got it back. Well, I, I realized like, I, I have no idea. Like I have no idea what this thing is because it took me and my, my father-in-law, you know, like 20 minutes to haul it out of the truck, get into the shed. And I open it up and it's like grease, grease Ooh. city. Like it's covered and caked and it's it was pulled out of like an old Wendy's or something like that. I realized like, oh, and it's gas too. So I need to have like a gas line to test it. And I'm, I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, and then we got to ship it and we got to freight this thing. I've never done freight in my life. I'm like, this is not the time to learn freight. And so after hemming and hawing and like, I could part this out, I could pull a couple pieces. I'm like, screw it. I just, I put it up on, on marketplace at free, free Holloway. And some company came and it was like a, a startup for some kind of business. So I helped somebody out, yeah. but you know, I lost three hours of my life plus and gas money and all that kind of stuff. But <laughs> so now you got the story. Life. Now you got the story on Pure Hustle podcast. So it was worth it. It was, it was worth, worth it. it. What are you going to what kind, what, what education can you get for a hundred bucks? That's going to teach you that kind of valuable lesson. I mean, yep. come on. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. And the, the reality is, is that, you know, you talk about staying in your lane, but the beauty about reselling too, is that you can get out of your lane. And as long as you're smart about it, it doesn't cost you that much, right? Yeah. You lost a hundred hmm. bucks, but that's better than investing in like, you know, something for like a thousand, two thousand or 10,000. Like, you spend a hundred bucks. Now, you know, if I come across those, there's certain things I need to check, certain things I can find out. And maybe you might come across one again. And this time you will pick it up because you know what to do. Maybe, I mean, I don't know if you freighted anything. I haven't freighted anything ever. Um, I, but, I, you know, that's one of the things I'd love to learn. But you could have, right? You could have learned it if you wanted to. And I think reselling brings the ability to learn all those different things, but still not lose a ton of money as long as you, you play it smart. Now, 
uh, talk about some good scores, all right? So tell me about what are some scores that, like, validated you, that told you, like, I know what I'm doing or <laughs> this is what I want to do. Give us a couple. Give us a couple. Sure. I, I I get asked you get asked this all the time, right? As a reseller, you throw it out there, and some people are like, "Oh, what's the craziest thing?" Yep. So I got I got three stories. Okay. If you got time? No, we have so, so plenty of time. Go for it. Number one, and they're they're in order of the, the the highest score I've ever had, like dollar amount per item. The biggest like haul I've ever had in my life, and then the the last one is probably my favorite, uh, but it wasn't monetary. So the the one that I've sold for the most money was I was at a garage sale um, where it was like one in the afternoon. And uh, the there's pile of, one in the afternoon. Who goes to garage sale that one in the afternoon? <laughs> highest score ever. The guy wow. that hits everyone in the valley. Like there you go, there you go. <laughs> we made it. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I pull out this like um, a big plaque that's kind of like that '80s, '90s retro pink kind of back plaque. And on the plaque, it was, it was like a homemade wooden plaque with three hamburgers that have big bulging eyes. Half hamburgers yeah. were sticking out of this plaque. They're kind of glazed over like uh, that amusement park kind of a feel to them. And they're heavy. Do you, do you know the restaurant? Is it McDonald's? Yes, no? sir. Yeah. So okay, these, all right. these were these were half hamburgers yeah, yeah. from like the original McDonald's that would like stick out of the wall yep. as decorations. And, you know, one was probably 12 inches wide and you had 10, 8 inches like it was a set. And, uh, you know, I didn't even say anything to the guy. The guy's like, 20 bucks, you can just have it. <laughs> I didn't say anything, not intentionally. Now, I wasn't trying to do the silence intentionally. I just, I had no idea what it was at the time. He's like, 15, you can have it. I'm like, I, I knew it was, I knew it was McDonald's. I knew it was something, but I'm like, sure, I'll take it for 15 bucks. Well, you know, you find out they are the originals. They are the original decorations from the original McDonald's. The guy was actually a manager at one of the McDonald's in town and uh, doing comps, you know, they're probably three to $800 a piece, something like that. And I, uh, I listed them at $3,000. Um, and this was still when I was part time and, you know, within mi minutes you get offers for a thousand, 1500 and declining those is one of the hardest things ever. But yep. anyway, it sold for $2,500, the, nice. the three set to some collector overseas. Whew, so that wow. was one of my favorite scores. That is amazing. The, the, uh, the second score has already been featured on this podcast was okay. the dolls. I found, yeah, no, but retell the story. It's okay. 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 Yeah. 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 Uh, so, so I was at a, a estate sale, uh, I think it was last, like a year ago now that it was around November and you, I, I walked into the room, um, that just had dolls lined everywhere. You know, you could tell this person was a collector and usually those dolls are like worthless, right? Like a lot, there's a lot of valuable dolls out there. I don't want to knock the doll sellers. There's a lot of great, great scores and dolls, but usually, right? Like they aren't worth the time to ship that yep. you, you really got to know what you're doing, all that kind of stuff. Well, these were Tonner dolls. And for folks that know Tonner dolls, like those are high end. Um, and this person had literally hundreds. They had other like collectible um, Diana Efner. They're, I think they're called Little Dreamer, Little Darling, something like that, that like sell in the you know, three to $800 range, hmm. depending. They, they had so Tonner, the Little Dreamers. Uh, they had all the, the actual good, oh, what's, the, what's the brand? Um, starts with Matt, Madeline, someone I can't remember. How do you spell Tonner? T O N N E R. Okay. T O N N E R. Okay. Uh, but yeah, the, he. Uh, but anyway, this this person, they they would go to the the uh, conventions, right? They would go to all these uh, doll conventions and get the limited edition, like only three hundred made or whatever. And so once I, I I didn't even know what they were. Like I've, I've not done dolls before, but you do that quick lookup and you see Tonner dolls, like the floor is 50 bucks a pop. Hmm. And so when they're selling them for $20 a piece is what they wanted. You just start piling. And so we got, I got boxes upon boxes upon boxes. And I ended up with over 150 of, of the Tonners and wow. then some other collectible dolls. And at the end of the day, the average sale price is well over a hundred dollars was well over a hundred dollars for those. And so 150, it, it was roughly $15,000 that we made off of a thousand dollar investment at that sale. That's incredible. And how, how, how much into your reselling was that? Like into your full time? Uh, that was three, four months, right? Cause uh, that would have been my first year academic year out and it was around November. So yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty early on. Well, and when you say that you, uh, you needed a thousand dollars a month to, to be at the break even, or, you know, just to be net zero <laughs> and you get 15 grand 
in, in one sell like that, like you're done for the year. You could just you could just oh, close yeah. up shop and relax for the rest of the year and start up again next year. You're good to go. Absolutely, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, that is that's amazing. All right, you got one more, right? I got one more. This okay. is so this is my favorite one. This is what I tell everybody when when they ask my favorite story. So I was at a sale that was an estate sale, and the lady who had passed away had donated her entire estate to a local charity in town that runs an indoor skate park. And so they had uh, for they had all the um, volunteers from the skate park and everything were, were there and they were, were running the sale, selling the items. And they, you know, someone pulled me aside. He's like, hey, are you, you know, are, are you a professional? Like, yeah, I, I do this. I sell full time and I, I resell online. He's like, oh, actually, no, I was part time at the time. So I said, yeah, no, I, I do this. I do this uh, reselling thing. And he's like, OK, come with me. So he pulls me into a closet where he has this um, microphone set up on a stand. And this was a retired music teacher or, or uh, the estate was for a, uh, a music teacher who um, loved her audio equipment. And this was a cool ribbon mic from the 1920s, I want to say. And it was that kind of really cool looking like, like that mesh covering and everything right. um, that would have been used in recording studios. And well, it they, they wanted money for it, right? Because they knew it was worth a good amount. It's probably worth around two to four thousand dollars. I mean, condition dependent. Uh, pro- probably less for this because it was not the best condition. Um, but they said it worked, and so uh, you know they wanted. They didn't know what they wanted for it. Um, and eventually, you know, they I got it out of them that someone had offered four hundred for it. They had declined, and so I'm like, okay, well, let me see what I can do for you. And so I, I looked it up, and I came back, and I said, okay, well, could we do six hundred dollars? And you know, they're like. Yeah, I think we could do that. Let's let's get it done. And so, I I came back the next day because they held it for me and and uh, we plugged it in. We everyone was kind of sitting in the circle there because this was like the highest dollar sale for these guys. And we we sang a little duet of "Hey Jude" just for fun into the mic just to make sure it worked. Nice. Me and the main estate sale, uh, runner, and you know, I, I paid the six hundred dollars and and you know everything was good. I took that mic. I took it home cleaned it up the best I could, but it was in kind of rough condition. I, I listed it and I sold the mic for $1,500 to a, a guy who refinishes them in Canada. And then I sold the stand because it was like an, an old stainless cool stand for about $300 to somebody else. So, you know, I, I was almost double, triple my money to, after fees and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then the guy who refinishes them is going to take that microphone and he took it and he sent me some cool photos of like when it was done it was really just shiny and new and just awesome. And he sold it in Canada to a recording studio who wanted that kind of thing. And for me, this, this just shows the power of reselling, the power of what mm-hmm. we do, right? Because this, in the middle of nowhere in Montana, you've got this really high-end bike that you don't have a market for here. Like you, you're not going to be able to sell that. They don't, they're not set up to sell it online. I am. I'm able to pay $600, which they're not going to get from somebody else. So they get the money to run this skate park, to do these cool things in the community. I take that. I'm able to feed my family and get it out there to someone who's going to take that and then put it to its final form and get it into a recording studio that's going to use that for years to come. And that just sums up like the the, the touchy feelings of what I love about reselling is we we preserve the past, right? We get these items from wherever they are into the hands of people who are going to use them and cherish them. Oh, no, that's awesome. Yeah, connecting connecting the items with the right people, right? You know, cause oftentimes resellers are often given a bad name that you're just going in trying to, you know, scalp tickets or whatever, you know, you're just trying to, to rip people off. But, but yeah, that's, that's none of us are going into this thing and I just want to rip people off. And when you have those experiences where you're actually getting to do that, where you're, you're connecting, like you said, you're preserving the past, you're connecting people that really need and could use an item Uh, to those items, right? Because they don't have time to go drive around everywhere hoping to maybe find that one thing they're looking for. So yeah, that's that's an incredible story. I love that. All the time, I always appreciate when people send you pictures like, hey, I bought this from you. I refurbished it. I sent it somewhere else. And you're like, wow, that's incredible. Like I had um, a toll toll thing that people would pay to get on buses. And I remember a guy, he works for San Francisco. uh, The bus system is Muni. And he did that for like 30 years. And I remember he really wanted my, uh, and I shared this on the podcast. He wanted my little uh, quarter thing. I forget what you call those, fair fair booth or whatever it was. And I remember he took it and he just made it look amazing. And just and he has like 30 of them. It's just, he has like his own little museum going, right? To know that my item like yours, yours in the recording studio, mine is in a museum. And I got a few items like that. 
that, you know, I ended up not making as much money as I wanted, but that's because either one, I didn't have the market or B or one or B <laughs> one or two. I just, you know, I didn't know enough to sell it. Right. But somebody else knew the value of that item. You knew the value of the item in your limited knowledge and it just ends up working that way. So that is, that is great. So what's, what's a typical day look like for you? Or like, you know, do you just source when you want? Are you disciplined? Like, do you have a schedule? Cause I feel that that is, the biggest downfall I think for full-time resellers, I say even that for myself, is that when I jumped to full-time, I just kind of did things when I wanted, and it worked out for a while. I mean, I I started full-time when like eBay was doing really well and things were, and maybe it's still doing well, but in my experience at that time, I felt like I could almost source anything and I could sell it. So mm-hmm. I kind of just was. Whenever I wanted to, I would list. Whenever I wanted to, I would source. But it caught up to me. And things did not go so well. But for you, it seems like you're very disciplined. So talk to us about how things look like for you. Well, yeah. I mean, you're, when you're your own boss, like that's, that's the game. You, got, you have to have that, that discipline. Uh, you, it, that, that freedom and that flexibility comes with the price of now you have those decisions to make each and every day. I, I, I think, I think uh, one of the hard, hard things in this job is – so like if, if you can't be at an event or you can't be be somewhere like in someone like say say your kid has a soccer game or something and I'm not saying that I'm running around like missing my kid's soccer game all the time but if there's like a big opportunity like at a, at a certain point you can't say like my employer says I have to work today you can't use that third party to put the blame on when you miss something important in your life and that's going to happen because there is sacrifice that goes into this. Um, I make my kids a priority. I make my family a priority. Um, but at the same time, there, there's an opportunity cost to everything. Uh, but but to get to the, the the root of what you were what you were talking about, how do you, um, you know, am I a scheduled person? Am I a scheduled person, or or how do how do I work with that? I I, I think the typical day for me is very scheduled. I get up. I make sure all my um, my listings are done. I make sure I get get everything packed up for the day. Um, so once everything's packed, I usually take my kids to school, um, cause I'm up at six in the morning, get them all ready. They have to be at school by eight. So I'll get them ready. I, I get everything packed and, uh, then I'll get home and I, I make sure my listings are done for the day. And then if I uh, can, I get outsourcing, uh, in the limited opportunity we have here. But, um, in the, in the summer, it is a little different because in the summer, it's like 75% of my time is spent sourcing. 25% is probably spent listing. And then it flops in the winter. Uh, to where I'm actually putting up more items now. Okay. So you say, you would say you have a consistent schedule every day. Like this is how it yeah. goes every day. I mean, yeah, but you, you build in that flexibility, right? Like if my kids yeah. got a field yeah. trip or something, I'm going to, I'm going to be on that field trip. Right. Yeah. Um, Cause you're able to do that kind of thing. But yes, I think, I think it's important to have a pretty consistent schedule. What you do. And, you know, it's funny, I've never heard anybody say that sometimes, well, the full-time reseller are saying, hey, if there's an opportunity, I have to do that, follow that opportunity, right? Usually you hear the other one is like, hey, my kid has a soccer game, I'm going to drop everything and go to that soccer game. But I think what you, what you said is very true, right? Because, yeah, there are those moments where, like, this is not, like, if it's your kid's soccer championship game, like, yeah. you ha- like, you have no options. Like, you must go to the game, like, right? Like, it could be... I, I don't know. It, it, everybody has their opportunity cost. For me, it would have to be like a million dollars for me to miss that soccer game, right? Yeah. Uh, for some people, it's like a thousand bucks, right? You got to just figure and, out what works for you. And that's true. Like, like I going back to uh, Mike touched on this. I think in either the last podcast or one before it, there was a, a book sale, right? And you had that opportunity of of I either have to take that day off work, and then I'm going to be kind of taken away from the team at work. I'm going to be af- having to take away a personal day and all that, and probably come up with some plans to to make a, a chunk of money. Or I can, you know, I'm, I'm going to end up going to the job. Uh, and that, that arises, that, that comes up all the time in reselling. Uh, and it, it's, it's so much easier to, to say to, you know, a spouse or a loved one or a friend, like, yeah, you know, I, I have to work today, like, because my boss is making me come in. Mm. But it's so much harder for people to digest when there is that, that kind of opportunity where, like, literally, you can make, like, 10 grand today, right? Because there's this opportunity and so you might have to miss out on an event. No, again, yeah. and it's funny speaking of people. Oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, wanna, speaking of, yeah, finish up, Orlando. You go for it. No, I just want to throw, I just, I empathize with Tim because I feel judged a lot of the times 
Because I'm like, I can't. I have to go to garage sales, right? And people look at me and they're like, <laughs> what? You can't do this? Like, you know, like at my church, like sometimes they do ministry on, on Saturday mornings. And like they put that judgment on me. And I'm like, wait a second. This was a regular job. No one would be saying uh-huh. that I'm doing something that's, you know, not like for my family. Right. Or not. But because I said garage sales, people instantly judge yep. me like I'm just like do this for fun, which I do. But it's, it's what how I pay the bills. Right. And so I totally get what you're saying, where there is so much judgment. <laughs> when you're like, I go to the state sale. Well, you can always go to the state sale. It's like, no, no, I don't think you understand the opportunity here. So I want to let you know yeah. I understand where you're coming from with that. Oh, no, 100%. And, and even in, um, I shoot, I mean, keep going back to education, right? Because I know I'm on with two educators here, where it's like uh, when you set up your classroom rules and expectations or whatever, like it's not like Mr. So and so is the bad guy, right? It's like, oh, that's so sad. Unfortunately, I can't let you do that because there's this there's this rule. There's this right. We 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 fall behind this policy, yeah. Be, and, and that ends up being the bad guy. And that's the same thing here. It's same thing applies. It's like when you when you have a, a real job, it's like oh you know that becomes the bad guy rather than like wait what are you doing Orlando like you're doing that to us because you know we're not important enough. <laughs> it's like you, no, you had to you you have to go buy a bunch of Pokemon toys. You you, <laughs> you know what I mean like. It, I just agree, comes oh, off, yeah. it just comes off weird, but it's the reality yeah, of it. it. <laughs> right? So I pre- so anybody listening, I think you guys know, let us know in the comments. If you haven't hit that like button yet, smash that like button. Uh, Tim's, again, I always, this interview has been phenomenal. I've learned so much. And if you have to, make sure to subscribe, hit that like button, hit that bell notification. Uh, but I, I just, I think about that because I tell people stories all the time. You know how it is, the, the glaze in their eyes, like, yeah, I couldn't. I couldn't go to this whatever thing because I picked up twenty advanced uh, Game Boy empty boxes, and they're like, "What?" Like, well, that was like four thousand dollars, but in their mind, yeah. like they're thinking that's just trash. Like, you just wasted your morning, you know. So yeah. you just anyways. gotta come up with euphemisms for things, right? Like instead of instead of saying you're a reseller, right? You're like, I'm a I'm a vintage goods curator, or you know, something like that. Um, so speaking of hard decisions, right? Cause you mentioned, you know, having to make some difficult decisions as far as like how to spend your time. There are some people listening right now who are at the same place you were at a few years ago and they're trying to figure out is, is reselling full time for me? What should I be looking out for? Uh, and you kind of already briefly touched on this, what that signal was for you, but what advice would you give somebody who's, who's thinking about it? Maybe they're part time right now. They're putting in the work. They understand reselling. Um, what advice would you give them, not just for making that decision, but what what to expect if they make that decision to become a full time reseller? Sure. Um, so, so I, I think the fir- the first thing is to know your numbers. You need to know what your numbers are. You need to know what you're doing. If you don't have that written down somewhere, like on a spreadsheet, even chicken scratch in a notebook, like if you don't know what you're actually making, it, it's you got to get that in line, uh, and then advice if you're if you're considering this whole thing full-time uh it, it sometimes is hard to to get introspective like with just yourself like you need to as far as what i did i i reached out to you know my my parents i reached out to um of course talked with my wife i talked with the best man at my wedding like best friend for life kind of guy that like these people know me inside and out and i just said hey here's what i'm thinking of doing and people that'll just be brutally honest with you and say like no this is a dumb idea or say no, Tim, you're, you're kind of weird. Like this is, this is like you, you could, you could probably do this, you know, um, be, because reselling really does take that, that special kind of personality. And so if you can find people that, um, that you trust that, that, you know, um, obviously when, it, when push comes to shove, like making this leap is, uh, is, is your decision. And that's a decision that only you can, you can, uh, come to, but, but get, get advice from people who know you the best. That's good. That's fantastic advice. All right. So we're going to wrap things up here. We got one last question. I always like asking this because, you know, Mike kind of had alluded to the fact of, you know, do you always plan on doing this? This is a vehicle. But where do you see reselling going in the next few years? Like, what do you do? You, do you see that eBay is still the place? Do you find that people are going to have to sell on multiple platforms? Do you, I mean, what, what are some things you're thinking about in prepping for the coming years? Yeah. Uh, Resell is not, reselling is not going anywhere. You know, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not going anywhere, but of course we're going to have to adapt. Um, I, I don't see eBay going anywhere particularly. Um, 
yeah, obviously this, I have no facts to back any of this. This is all just straight up my opinion. That's uh, okay. but, <laughs> but eBay, eBay, I don't think is going anywhere, but it might finally meet its match. You know, if, if someone can, can find out a good way to stop just taking those, like you guys have talked about before the, the, the vertical slices out of it and actually create a really solid platform that sells everything. Um, it, it could be time to jump ship, but, but online selling is not going anywhere. You know, um, the, from everything I hear, the, the markets are going up for, for pre-owned goods. Um, there's going to be more competition, I think, from uh, companies themselves as they open up, you know, they're, they're reclaimed and everything like that. Um, but, you know, and, and AI might change things, right? It, it is changing things like as we speak, like it's already happened. Um, but how long before, you know, the robots actually take over? I don't know. And I don't know if they ever will, you know, like because people are lazy. People are always going to need to get rid of their stuff. And if you're willing to to hustle harder than the next person, I think there's a living to be made here. All right. So last minute advice, any last minute things you feel like you want to share with our audience? I have no last minute advice, but I do have a question for you, Orlando. Oh, man. Okay. I don't know if you ever answered this on the podcast, but has the bike ever been ridden? (laughs) All right. So let's give a little bit of background. So I got really motivated. I forget which book it was. Um, I don't even know which book it was, but it was one of our book cities and it was about, I, I confess that I never learned how to ride a bike and I, so I'm just gonna be real with it. I, I borrowed a bike from a good friend of mine. He's like, Orlando, you take as long as you need to, to learn how to ride a bike. I, I went on a few attempts and I just gave up and it sat in my garage for a year and he called me up and he said, Hey, so can I get my bike back? I was like, yeah, it's right here. And, uh, yeah, so, uh, you know, I appreciate you asking that. Um, you know, what's funny is uh, somebody I'm, I'm working close with now, uh, and I'm doing some work with the school, he rides bikes all the time. So it's one of those things I'm going to have to. Like, it's just going to – I don't have an option, right? So stay tuned uh, over several months. I appreciate the accountability, Tim. Um, I was <laughs> – Insta- was, What's that? We want the Instagram reel. Once it happens. Oh, man. I got to tell you. You know, it's funny. Um, like the other day, the other day when I borrowed that sit-down mower, like you, those who drive, I guess they drive like a ch- tank. Like, you know, you got to turn the right to the left. I don't know if you, anybody knows what I'm talking about with the sit-down mowers. But mm-hmm. I remember the guy was like, here it is. Just just take it. And I'm like, I don't know how to ride these things. He's like, it's just like a tank. And he's a military guy. And I'm like, well, I, I've never driven a tank. Like, I don't know what that looks like. He's like, you just got to get on there and you got to figure it out. And I'm like scared. This is like a multi-thousand dollar machine that this guy's just lending me. And I have to like drive down a long driveway, drive into traffic and then drive into my house. And I just got on it and I was scared out of my mind. And eventually I got the handle of it. And I remember when I was sitting there, I was thinking about the bicycle. It's so odd that you asked me this question. This was just a couple of days ago. And I go, why didn't I put in that much effort into riding the bicycle? I know part of it is I needed to mow this lawn. Like I had no options. Like if I didn't get this mowed, like I may get fined by the city because of fire risk and all that. So it's something I had to get done. So if there's some motivation as to why I must ride a bike, maybe like, you know, cars will no longer be available for sourcing and you must learn to ride a bike. I don't know. Something's going to have to push me to doing it but uh hey you know what this, the, it might become your new niche like you get on a bike you realize you love it and next thing you know you're the uh the bike part salesman like you're sourcing bikes at, at garage oh. sales you're selling you're selling gears and 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 the shifters and seats and all that stuff man this could be it man this could be your million dollar niche there, there you go there you go but tim i very much appreciate that that uh i need to be held accountable on that i kind of thought everybody would forget but t- tim remembered tim remembered so hey uh I listen, Tim. We are just so honored that you came on the podcast. By the way, uh, Tim and I are going to be on another podcast on Wednesday called the Gold Paper Podcast. That is the YouTube channel. Uh, check us out. Um, it's going to be a podcast about educators that left full time teaching to be full time resellers. So if you're still wondering and thinking, that's going to be a great conversation. It's going to be myself and Tim and uh, two other uh, former educators that have gone full time. So if you'd like to join us there, uh, Mike, you have anything else you want to add before I close this out? 
No, I think this was great. And, uh, and, and Tim, I don't think this is going to be the last time we have you on the podcast. Uh, we'll have to get you on more often. Uh, maybe, especially, I think our lives would be a good one too, just to have you in to, to, to share because we love interacting with people. And I'm sure uh, a lot of our audience would love to ask you some questions as well. Yeah, I, I do. It, it, it would be good if we brought, you know, people from the past. Like, we'll have one with, like, Wayne, K-Way Shop, and Tim the Slim, and us two. Like, I think stuff like that would be cool. So stay yeah. tuned, everybody. Uh, make sure to hit that bell notification so you are aware when those episodes drop. And with that being said, make sure to be real. Be relevant. And be reselling. Thank you, Tim the Slim. Thanks. Thank you, guys. Peace.